Hi there, welcome to the Digital Insurance Pint podcast. I'm your host, Tom Reed, and I'm here with uh, Steve Earle, CEO of Cheap Insurance, Jeff Roy, CEO of Excalibur Insurance, and Cheers. Adam Mitchell, CEO of Mitchell and Whale. And uh, you can tell this, uh, we're obviously into summertime now, although uh, Steve's sitting on a chair made of uh, downhill skis, so um, <laughs> We'll be a little more relaxed this session. Hopefully, uh, keep it keep it lively. What's everybody's drink of the day? Adam, what do you got? It's kombucha and and cider in in one. Nice. What do you got? Garrison Brewery, great nice. customer of ours down the street. Lovely awesome. smooth drinking ale. Purchase some awesome. today. Awesome. Tom, what are you drinking? Uh, Smirnoff Ice here. I don't know. Awesome. Way to support really? local, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I bought I bought it locally. What can I tell you? Yeah. Okay. I got I got a Stegel little uh yeah. my as I say my precious, but something a little fun. All right, guys. So we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, I'm gonna ask you uh, uh, the age old question: um, direct versus broker versus agent. And I'm gonna, I would want you to think about it in the sense of who's gonna win in the new digital slash post COVID world. You know, each channel has its uh, has its um, strengths and weaknesses, and we, let's let's figure out which one's going to have a uh, which one's advantage is going to win in in the in the new world that's coming. All right. So first question for you guys: uh, Brokers, give or take, have about fifty percent market share in the uh, private auto provinces. Each of you guys is growing faster than the market, so you are obviously gaining market share from somewhere. I'm interested in knowing where that market share is coming from. Is it coming from the half that's already controlled by brokers or is it coming from the other half that's controlled by the directs and agents? And uh, maybe Jeff, I'll get you to dive into that one first. Yeah, is it, I would say we were, we're getting business from all channels. Like we're getting from brokers, from agents, from directs. If I was to put a number on it, I would suggest probably 50% broker, uh, 25% agent and probably 25% direct if I was to split it down. But uh, it's a good cross section. We don't really run detailed metrics on where we're taking it as much as we should. Uh, we do have records of you know, who were you insured with last and we, we do have some data on that, but we could probably do a lot better job to look at that because it could actually key into our marketing a bit better. So, so that's actually more or less the actual existing market share. So you're kind of taking it uh, you know, more or less the same from, 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 from the other channels. Okay, um, Steve, you're purely digital and from one of our last conversations growing quite rapidly these days. Where is your business coming from, this channel? I would say it's higher than Jeff's, 70% uh, broker and then 30% uh, direct. So it's not, in, not necessarily entirely indicative of what the, the market share looks like. We're taking okay. a bit more from brokers. Adam, how about you? Where's your, where's your new business coming from? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm waiting for updated numbers, but three years ago when we measured it, it was 50-50. So when, once you start sort of producing a, over a million dollars in business, I, I have a hard time believing it's going to be much different than the market share. Uh, I don't think anybody bleeds all that much that you get from one. You kind of win a little bit from everywhere. Um, so, yeah, 50-50. Okay, so actually, that's you just, know what, Tom? I, I want to okay, sort of put out to one... I guess the audience of like how you can get those numbers. Cause I think it might fascinate some um, on the bottom of everybody's application, at least in Ontario, you're having to declare where you're last insured for auto insurance. So because we fill out the app inside power broker, we have that field filled inside there. So we can just extract from there. Uh, what was the last known marketplace? And then it paints us a picture of, if Walwanisa is winning business, where are they winning it from and where are they losing it to? And so it, it becomes an interesting look. Yeah, that, that, go ahead, Jeff. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we kind of the same thing on the, on the quotes on the new business side. We have an activity. If we lose something to somebody, you know, we have an activity who we lost it to and we have put the difference in premium. So it's interesting. When our biggest one, uh, new business losing new business opportunities has always been the directs, TD, Bel Air, uh, uh, Sonnet. Uh, those are kind of the big three that we compete with. And I would suggest we probably lose 70 to 80 new policy opportunities. We're not losing them in the office, but we're not bringing them in. And there's a, a fairly hefty price tag on that. 
Well, I, obviously brokers have been trying to slow down the market share shrinkage for years and it's, it has flattened out last little while. And you know, the next job is to uh, take back some shares. So knowing where things come from and where they're going to is an important part of that, uh, that battle. So uh, that's, that's a great uh, catch and hopefully uh, other brokers will start to track that and get some, uh, some better stats down the road. So I found it interesting that uh, J- Jeff, you mentioned that you got about, uh, it's more or less market, market neutral is where it's coming from. Adam's suggestion was that, you know, if you're big enough, it's going to be market neutral just because of the law of large numbers. So let me actually, I'm going to jump to a further question down, uh, down our script here. Do customers even know what channel they're using or choosing when they, when they uh, reach out to you guys? And uh, maybe Adam, I'll let you go first on this one. I, I haven't surveyed them, but I, I don't have any evidence or experience to believe they do. I think there is uh, a few really engaged ones that will tell you, oh, well, you're my broker. and This is what I want and things. But I got to think that's the strong minority. Uh, I think on mass, they're confused over who's the company, who's the broker, an agent from a broker, a direct from a not. Like it's that's so tough to tell unless you have the internal nuance. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do you think that is? I, I, would, I, I would suggest that you never heard that song from Robin Thicke and Pharrell, the insurance blurred line. Maybe I'm going deaf. Maybe I'm going blind. Maybe I'm out of my mind. Some by Pharrell, or you, you probably remember that tune, right? Can we do a retake? Retake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maybe I'm out of my insurance. Oh, no, the point, the point okay. is uh, what's happening is most of the providers are using similar tactics, the websites of directs and brokers, there's a blurred line between how they look. There's a blurred line between everybody's using similar tactics oh. for SEO, for website. Uh, they're, you know, they got chatbots. Like the tools that are being used between the channels is blurring, so the consumer is not really identifying anything different. I'm going to take a bit of a different angle and say, I, I bet you you don't know uh, what designation your financial advisor has. Um, I bet you, you know, the 90% of public don't know the difference between a seg fund and a mutual fund. I bet you that 80% of the public don't know whether they have a a V6 or a turbocharged four. Like there's just a certain level of, we are people that sell insurance. We're up against other people that sell insurance. And I don't think there's been a great effort for people. Like, why would you want to understand that? It's just, it's below the surface of things of what you're after to solve. You're not going to win anybody based on, pumping your service level standards. That's not why people are shopping. That's not what, not why people are coming to your storefront. So you got to create a, a unique and different storefront, be it digital or not. And they come in, they look around, they kick some tires and they think, okay, I kind of, kind of like the feel of the store a bit. Maybe I'll ask them how much the pants cost. So and what it really what a- comes down to what the pants cost initially, initially, you're not, to me, you're not, you're not winning maybe a certain percent of your business, but you're not winning 90% of your new business because you have some sort of incredible value proposition that they've, they've come to you for. I'll, I'll give you the 80-20 rule on that. Like I, I'll, I'll tell you that probably 80% is going to side with the price, but I, I think that leaves out a big swath of uh, commercial that has certain expectations, a big swath of VIP or people of high value high assets yeah i'm not like, really talking about them adam i'm not talking about yeah I'll, I'm I'll talking give you about 80. The, uh, the average joe picks up the phone or goes online and googles insurance yeah okay but on the other side tell me they won't leave you pretty quick if you don't hold up a decent level of service the, that's the thing you 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 win them on price keep them on service Ooh, that's a bumper sticker Wait, oh, Steve, you you're in your garage. Do you have my bumper sticker on your, can you, can I do. you walk us over to your, to your, oh, Tom, you're going to like this. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah, we got it. Direct <laughs> writers have been canceled. Well, that was my end, view on it. And not everybody wants the cheapest. Do you want the cheapest uh, heart surgery on the internet and do it yourself? Or do you want the surgeon that actually is the best one around, right? So cheap, no, that depends on the customer, right? Some yeah, customers but, don't give a shit. Another thing is the only 8% of people have claims. So people don't give a shit about the coverage till they give a shit when something happens. Right. Right. You know what? In our traditional shop, that's where we see people we lost to directs come back. It's after a loss or yeah. after a bad experience where they didn't have an advocate yeah. and they regretted it. I'll, um, 
when I was on the uh, IBAA board a decade ago, so a long time ago, I don't, but I don't think things have changed. We did some consumer research and um, the research showed that uh, the vast majority of customers, now again, we're talking personal lines, non, non-VIP types so of mass market personal lines. Um, they were looking for uh, price and convenience. Price was number one, convenience was number two. And we did this, we asked brokers, so Alberta brokers, the same question, you know, what, what did they think was the most important thing? And they chose choice and advocacy. Uh, and it, Steve's, you know, hit it on the, on the head again. It seems like it hasn't changed in the last 10 years. You know, you win them on that price or, or that convenience. You know, convenient enough, cheap enough, a uh, combination of the two, and then you win them. But then, you know, unless nothing ever goes wrong in their lives, you got to keep them on, on the choice and the advocacy. Brokers want to do things exactly the same. And they want to spend gobs of money trying to convince the consumer that the broker way of doing stuff is the better way to do it versus the broker moving to way the consumer wants to do the way of business. So obviously price matters. Like you don't have a competitive price. The conversation is irrelevant. People can love you, but not 25% more love you, right? Yeah. There's not enough value you can add. So they don't care about that. It doesn't regardless of the consumer. So your next question is who's going to win? <laughs> well, that's, that's the overall question. So, so let, let me talk to you about, let me ask you, what proof can you offer me that brokers do a better job for consumers? At the end of the day, you know, let's ignore the, ignore the price side. I mean, you could argue choice and that, you know, you have a better chance of having a better price for someone. Let, let's ignore that though for a second. Prove to me that brokers ultimately have the best interest and can demonstrate that best interest of the consumer at heart. Um, I think that I don't have analytics on this. It'd be interesting to measure, but if we measure it in the number of minutes per day, broker staff uh, engage with a claims adjusters and B underwriters or C billing people about shit gone sideways by insurers and advocating them. So claims, not happy what's going on with this, that, checking back, and so on. Billing issues, trying to straighten those out. And uh, looking at, you know, putting forward business cases for this is a good risk because of, you know, this. All of that is missing. And I would, I would, I don't know, maybe the guys can chime in uh, here, but I would say that probably consumes overall and personal lines 20% or greater of our day. I'm just guessing, you know, that's a ton of time that we're spending um, basically advocating by in one way or another in different parts of the transaction or the process or the claim or whatever on behalf of our insurance of which they would have nobody to do that if they were dealing and being frustrated directly with an insurer, be it billing claims or an issue with their policy. Why did my rate go up? Well, Actually, I'll, I'll take that 20% even higher because we're talking about remarketing. So, go, wow, Tom's policy went up by X amount. We're going to actually engage. Tom, you didn't even know this is going on. We've gone out. Your renewal is now with company B instead of A because of this, that, and the other. We found a better price. If there's proactivity going on there, Tom didn't have to li- lift a finger. And he's with a new supplier because the other one went up exponentially or there was an issue with it we remarketed a renewal because you're whatever whatever reason right yeah. so take the level of the energy and activity that the average broker spends advocating for their insured and all those things are advocations um that's what makes us different i'll break the rules although you took choice off the table i, I kind of want to go back to it because i think it's a massive differentiator and I bring up choice because if you go to a, uh, let's do another similarity, um, an investment advisor and they have one set of mutual funds to sell you. And I go into my bank and they can sell me which one of these do you want high risk, medium or low risk. Uh, here's the mutual fund. Our guys do it. You get one of the three. That's not a whole lot different than going to a direct writer. One of those might be a perfect fit for me right? Likely it's a medium fit and I've left a little money on the table and it's not. But the chances of it being the right fit for me as I go through the different stages of my life are pretty rare. And the other one I pull up, I'm going to, this is a 
see if we can pull it on here. Uh, you can see it a little bit, a lot of glare. Okay. Great window. So a bit Great of window. window. Yeah. So here is uh, a list of all the insurance companies that we bound business with since January. Now, what I want to show on there is that there's two leaders and it's economical and Wamanisa at the moment. Economical didn't win any of that business last year. That's a newer thing this year as they've become competitive. But if I were to only pick one of those companies and become an agent or a direct writer, that means the other thousands of clients would not have had the best fit possible for them. And so because we had the whole choice of market and we could say that eh, doesn't matter to us where you go, but this is the right situation for you with your house, your cottage, your car, your kid that had an accident, whatever the mix up is of your family. Um, I feel we ended up with a much better tailored solution for those clients. So I'm going with choice. To think about it, I think grocery store is a better analogy. A lot of the direct writers maybe have one or two aisles of products. And if you go in there for a quick fix or it fits you properly, great. Whereas a broker, maybe more like a superstore or Costco, or it has, you know, 25 aisles where you have different products, you can help them in different areas. Uh, you're not limited to two or three products. And at the end of the day, it comes down to business model too. Like who's got a competitive price? You know, our, our companies, I feel like a lot of the direct writers are buying business. Like some of them are taking a huge loss to buy business only to spike rates. And Steve mentioned a company uh, that really had to spike rates. So you can buy a business, but are you better to get a really good deal for one year or are you better to get a really decent deal for five, 10 years, build up loyalty with one particular company? So if something bad happens, they actually know who you are and they care. And that's that actually still means something in today's world. Uh, that's where loyalty comes in. So I think brokers can breed a lot more loyalty than some of the other direct, con direct to consumer companies where you're just a name and a number and nobody knows you until something happens. But I want to add one more point on this one. Uh, back in the days where we were adding insurance companies to our roster really quickly, every time we added one to it, our closing rate went up. And it's, it's not a whole lot different than Jeff adding another shelf to his superstore and, and, you know, getting a little more options. You just get the right fit. And to Steve's point of winning on price, you have the right price and product for the person more often when you have more options. Now, th so, at this point, this point, I want to point out that the part of Tom Reed will now be played by Steve Earle. <laughs> okay. So our next question on the agenda is who's going to win? Uh, yes. You had mentioned, uh, Tom, the, the top things for the consumer were convenience and price. I yeah. think price, convenience price is first. first. Price first, price, convenience Then second. convenience. Okay, yeah. so they're, they're probably running even more neck and neck now. Um, who's going to win? Like, insofar as brokers, we, we have price okay because we have multiple markets. And like Adam said, every time he added a market, his closing ratio uh, went up because he had more opportunity to be the right price for that specific consumer and, and whatever their profile was. The convenience piece is in shambles. And if we're talking about who's going to win in that 50% market share, which I think is sort of leveled off, it's been in the low 50s for, what, 15, 20 years now? Since the direct showed up and took about 20, 25%. Um, if we can get the convenience thing done better, and then I think we'll, we will take market share back because we will have price, convenience, and choice, and advocacy. It's the convenience piece where we're failing. And the, the, the thing that will give us that convenience piece is connectivity. Connectivity in our, in our industry needs to be solved in order for brokers to really deliver that convenience piece efficiently to the customer. Bingo. Uh, the other thing too is uh, I will point out that you have to look at the directs. I'm going to stick up for to say Desjardins and cooperators that they do a good job. They have a, they don't sell as many options on auto insurance, but they blend the auto, the life insurance, uh, the different investments into one portfolio. So they're able to offer, they're probably doing a better job of selling more products to a consumer and boxing them in. So I would suggest those companies are doing a good job and their model is very strong. And you'll notice back to Steve's point, they've got some of the uh, connectivity stuff looked after. Whereas over the next 12 to 18 months, 
I'm excited to see what IBO and IBAC and CZO do to build that connectivity because if we can build that connectivity, we have an awesome value proposition. Who's in a better place to disrupt than us right now if we get our shit together and we start looking after our data, our connectivity, and creating that customer experience in the brand? We're in a really good position, but there's still a ton of work to be done. So here with, with Adams, uh, every time, so it's like scales. Every time he added markets, his close ratio went up, but his efficiency went down because he's adding complexity to his back shop. You, you start to take markets back. You go down to three markets. You're the most efficient, well-run shop in town and your profit, product, uh, profitability goes way up. So it's a scale of one or the other. If we can solve that efficiency with connectivity and then create more convenience for the customer, that's Shangri-La. Like having the efficiency and productivity of a single market shop offering choice. So um, I shall pause for two seconds to see if anybody does not agree uh, that connectivity is one of the biggest issues um, in, 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 the, in the broker world these days. One, two, okay, nobody disagrees. I think, that well, is absolutely number yeah. one. I think so, it's big, but I think brokers do need to be willing to open the same hours and be able to staff the same sort of response time on the okay. phone lines. So, like, sorry, sorry, Adam, you're, you're, you're hitting, cause you're hitting on exactly the thing I want to prompt you guys on is so, so great. Connectivity is awesome, but no individual broker can make that go. Right. No. We need the IBOs. We need the IBACs. We need yes. the CZOs. We need the vendors, the carriers, all, everybody who's not us. Right. So yep. what, what can an individual broker do? to win against the directs in the post COVID, you know, more digital world. If you're, um, if you're ABC brokerage and you want to take more biz away from the directs, what can you do? Yeah. So we are, we're open 8 AM to 8 PM and we're open Saturday and we're pushing for Sunday now. Um, and we make sales on that. We get service calls on that and people appreciate it. Um, I think, the I'll, I'll take one point of it and leave some for the other guys of um, if you, if you don't have connectivity, so we're not going to have connectivity for, you know, at least months, if not years, there's a lot of problems and it'll come in spits and firsts as the, you know, different companies let it out at different times. Um, but I think if you had a little introspection on your brokerage and are you running the best possible business you could be, are you giving the best level of service with the tools that you have? Um, and that could be picking up the phone on the first ring and never having a voicemail and, you know, all of these sorts of pieces of demand, Steve's dead, right? The, the more companies, the more difficult it is to run and stay on top of them. It's, uh, Jeff, let's go over to you. So, um, what, what do you think brokers can do to be more competitive with that direct channel? I think the biggest thing I agree with all those things a hundred percent, but it's about our data is actually being able to consume it at all the touch points of the client journey, sharing it, aggregating it with some other brokers. And then that way we can find like, you know, there's a certain niche or subgroup you should be going after. You know, I call them personas, but maybe you're good with families. Maybe you're good with double income, no kids people. Maybe you're good in a certain area. With all that data, you can dial it in at a whole different level. And then, you know, with the power of things like a marketing cloud, you can actually go and find people like that. A lot of people are, it's more like the, the shotgun approach, hope it hits somebody versus the tiger, the, the uh, rifle approch when you're targeting stuff. And I would suggest, that, and this is more on the personal line side, is we need to use our data to, be, to build better customer journeys, to show up and wow people at every touch point. And as Ad, back to Adam's point, Steve's point, that could be being there. Like if somebody calls in at 11 o'clock on a Saturday and you have a virtual assistant that's working for you over in Singapore that you trust to be in your system, they can pick up the phone and complete that person. They go, wow, that person completed me. That's good. So I think data is the big thing is just sharing it, using it to insight. We have to control our data better and use it. And none of us like myself, Adam and Steve don't have enough data by ourselves, but together that tells a really good story. Amazing what we could do. Right. Um, the, I, I think Tom, back to your question, the, the one of the challenge that if you say the average broker is scale. So if you want to be open, like Adam from eight in the morning till eight at night and on weekends and stuff like that, you're going to have to have the level of scale of yeah. volume to create revenue during those hours to justify it. And that, and that's just math, right? Like 
unless you're large enough and you have enough volume of which, you know, cheap doesn't, we're, we're not, we can't be there on Saturdays and Sundays and float yeah. the boat during hours where the productivity and the, the number of leads coming in might be 20% of what it normally is. Mm -hmm. um, the, the consumer is not, is largely nine to five right now still. Cause I, I don't know. I think they have it in our heads that we're still nine to five. Um, lunchtime is huge because they're on their, but until it levels out and we're getting as many calls because we monitor exactly when the calls come in time of day and all that, when those start hitting levels where we can justify having a human being there during that, we'll, we'll put them there, but you're going to have to have the scale to do it. Right. Yeah. And you're going to have to have the numbers to show it. The That's other thing the that hasn't happened in the shift is right now the consumers in Canada, less than 5% are happy quote binding an issue online. If that number balloons up to 20, 30% like the UK and you built a better mousetrap and a better system, then you can be working 24 seven, but you're not actually paying a staff person. Your system is doing it. And Sonnet was one of the first forays into it. And I've heard through the grapevine, one of the direct writers has employed the people that built Sonnet to build something for them. So if they have kick-ass rates and they can provide that service that could become a real threat right somebody can yeah. provide it simple and easy so if the brokers can't make it simple and easy and offer 24 7 that you know that could be a wow service right now but wow services slowly become the status quo and everybody expects it right and that's cool yeah. don't there. don't make assumptions about consumer behavior until you have because 50 percent of the time i think that we're wrong so you, i go back to that weekend stuff we we were open on saturday and sunday uh, out of the shoot and we had these expectations now we're open on saturdays from 10 till 3 because because we monitored exactly when the phone was ringing and we we dialed it back so uh let's, let's wrap this one up i'm gonna do gonna give you guys each 30 seconds to go jeff steve adam um what's your secret weapon and specifically as it relates to um taking business away from the directs what sets your business apart for the director writers in your opinion i would suggest uh, brand we we look a little bit different uh inside most importantly our people we have the human to human touch we get on the phone doesn't matter the technology we get on the phone and connect with people age to age human to human and we have a dedicated account manager so they're not getting some random joe or sally every time they're getting the same person awesome steve what's your secret weapon um solving problems that can't be solved by directs. So when we take a piece of business from a direct, nine times out of 10, it's because somebody's added complexity in some way to their account. Be it they've had an accident or they bought a rental income property or now they have a boat and the direct can't do it. They've added some sort of complexity, be it negative to risk or positive or, or something outside of that direct box where we can take care of it because we offer choice and we have multiple markets. The secret weapon is right there. Awesome. All right, Adam, you get to close out this, uh, this episode with uh, sharing your secret weapon. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that our uh, difference is, is going to be the acquisition cost will be significantly lower on a per client basis than any of the direct writers. So our ability to onboard clients for, for less money um, gives it staying power. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And that wraps this episode where we're talking about uh, who's going to win in the digital world, brokers versus agents for directs. And as always, thanks to Steve, Adam, and Jeff uh, for sharing their, uh, their wisdom. And uh, in Adam's case, nice view of his backyard. <laughs>